start off with um, Christoph Apley, who is from the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, Sciences, and he will be speaking about oil weathering today. So I'm going to let Christoph take over. Thanks a lot. So uh, I came all the way up from Maine, but I have to say, like, uh, I didn't escape the snow there, but so, so my memory of Mobile is last time I've been here, it actually snowed here. This was like during a Gomery conference, which is pretty uh, interesting. So um, I was fortunate enough to do my postdoc with Chris Reddy, who's going to speak just after me. And um, I arrived there 2011, and there were like a lot of Deepwater Horizon samples. And, and I was like, everything I know about oil, I learned from him. And uh, uh, we could do some, I think, some, some good research with this. So um, I'm now located uh, uh, up in beautiful Maine. and. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we kind of like know about the oil that actually has been beached on the Gulf of Mexico. And this is just a picture from yesterday, so Chris and I went uh, on a little stroll along the beaches of uh, Gulf Shore and Fort Morgan. And if you look closely, you still can find this little sand paddies there. That's um, all the sand paddies that are there are, are still uh, oil from the Deepwater Horizon incident. And if you look at what portion of the oil this actually is, just want to stress, this is just like a small portion of the oil that, that was released. So this is a, approximately this 10% or estimates vary of the leaking mass that ended up on the surface, ended up on the, on the beaches. And although it's just 10%, I think this is still the oil we, we still can see and we can actually use to learn something about it. So I like to um, put it, if, if you just think about the general uh, processes that happen once oil enters the environment, you have these different weathering processes that are um, all well known from spreading, drift, evaporation, so all this physical process. Then you have the, the processes that are um, more chemical, like biodegradation or photooxidation, where something happens. And what we have the chance now with following up on, on collecting this sample is we can actually expand this diagram and, and to increase our understanding on um, oil weathering processes. So what we have is we start sampling pretty early on of, of this weathered oil samples, and we kind of like see it as, as Chess put it before, the Gulf of Mexico is like kind of like a natural laboratory where you have this huge input of oil, and now this oil is still weathering, and if we keep um, sampling and then collecting this oil, we can learn something about how this oil uh, weathers. We have some, some favorite spots. So um, this is uh, Gulf Shore, Fort Morgan, uh, and then here Grand Isle, um, kind of like this covering the, the whole width of where you still can find this little sand paddies. Um, we have samples from all the way 2010, although I have to say we have a little bit of a gap in samples that are really early. And now we just got a Gomery grant to continue our research to uh, sample during the next three years to continue doing that. So that should give us an almost 10 year um, time series. And I just want to kind of like maybe summarize what, what we found are, or the, the surprising findings we found is, first of all, if you look at oil, um, there are actually not just, the oil is not just going to CO2. The, there are actually oil transformation products that are prevalent and quite recalcitrant. So we call this oxygenated hydrocarbons. Um, I think this is the first finding that, that excited us. And the second is, um, more from a practical point of view, if you think of oil forensics, you always rely on this very recalcitrant compound that you can use to do fingerprint oil. This is especially important in the Gulf of Mexico where you have this 4,000 of oil installation platforms. You want to make sure you can track the oil back to the right source. And key oil fingerprinting compounds, they actually degrade quite rapidly. So it's just like informs us how to use this oil forensics technique. And I want to spend my 20 minutes talking about these two issues. So first of all, let me jump right into the oxygenated hydrocarbon. So why should we care at all about this oxygenated hydrocarbon? So these are oil hydrocarbons that have oxygen attached to it. 
So it can be either formed through biodegradation, bacteria can add this oxygen, or photooxidation. You can have sunlight and having some reactive oxygen species that add this. And I think if you look at the literature, more and more um, papers show that some of these oxygenated hydrocarbons can actually have toxic effects. So this is an example here looking at where is fraction of crude oil. There is an example of looking at the naphthenic acids from, from like tar sands, which are probably pretty similar to, to our oil degradation products we have here. Or we have um, like contaminated sites where you find um, polar compounds that have effects there. And I should just say, all about, or most of oil and toxicity has been focusing on, on the PAHs, which are uh, thought to be the most toxic compounds. And I think we should um, also include this novel compound, or have a closer look at this novel compound to see if you look at long-term effects of, of oil, then maybe this oxygenated hydrocarbon can also have an impact and can explain some of the toxicity we currently cannot really explain with pHs alone. So how do you measure them? Jeff in the previous presentation mentioned that um, you can measure the hydrocarbons with GC, uh, with gas chromatography, and once it gets polar, all of a sudden you cannot do this anymore. So uh, we used a, a very simple and you know, kind of old method to look a, on a bulk level, just to get a broad overview, is this um, SARA analysis, saturated aromatic resin and asphaltene. This is um, thin layer chromatography coupled to, to aphidy, which gives you just a, a, a ballpark of how much saturated aromatic compounds you have, which would be the, the non-polar material, and how much of this uh, polar compounds, we call this polar one or polar two, or if it's crude oil, you can also call it resins and asphaltines, just kind of like how much we have on this. This will be on, on a bulk level, which turned out to be a, quite a, a useful method. If you want to look at it on a molecular level, generally oil, then um, you, you have also several methods available. So if you're just interested, if you just use GCMS, you have access to, to biomarkers, PAHs, N-alkane, and partly of this unresolved complex mixture. So that's, uh, that's kind of like hump that you see on a GC chromatogram that uh, is, is, is a, a big variety of, of compounds. So if you want to resolve this unresolved complex mixture, you need to have some more novel methods. For example, two-dimensional cheese, uh, gas chromatography allows you to look more into that. And if you want to have access to the polar compounds, which are not cheesy amenable, you either need to do some chemical modification of this to analyze it on cheesy, or you need to use some liquid chromatography-based system or um, ultra-high-resolution mass spectrometry. So um, this is kind of like what, what we have uh, at this time. And I think the Deepwater Horizon spill really advanced our um, kind of like analytical capabilities to go towards this more polar compound. So let me talk now about uh, our time series of samples. So if you look at a GC chromatogram, you see uh, compounds disappear. So all these chromatograms, the top one will be the wellhead, then we have a surface lick, a sam paddy collected April 2011, and then we had also some rock scraping, if you just like scrape off oil of rocks. Um, this is all scaled just to 100% so that the last sample is basically just the, the little hump that you see on top. If you remove all the, the big peaks, all that remains is this hump. So you see everything disappears. If we then use our, uh, if you use TCMS to, to quantify PAHs, you can uh, look at it and also realize, well, probably 95% of these PAHs also disappeared during, during this time. Then we used our uh, TLC FID, this bulk characterization of the oxygenated compounds, and we saw a different story, that there, this, this fraction seems to be increasing. Um, and we don't really see anything increasing on, on GC. So um, if we then just measure how much we actually can uh, see on GC, so just like calculate if you have a sample and shoot it on GC and see how much do you recover on GC, 
you see that pretty much the more of this polar compound you have, the less is GC amenable. So the conclusion here is the oxygenated hydrocarbons are outside of the GC analytical window. So if we use our traditional methods, we don't really see these new types of compounds. And the other thing we realized, if we quantify these oxygenated hydrocarbons on a bulk level and um, do a time series of how much of a sample is not GC amenable, um, the Macondo well oil has just like 10% asphaltene resins. Then you have samples collected on the surface or kind of freshly oiled uh, grass plates um, or then sand paddies. So within 100 days of weathering um, or after the spill, you already have about 50% of the sample is this oxygenated hydrocarbons. And this then uh, continuously starts to increase over time. So that means it's rapidly formed, but it's also not a, a very labile transformation product that just disappears immediately again. It's just like keeps, keeps uh, increasing there. Um, why do we call it oxygenated hydrocarbons? We did some just bulk um, elemental analysis and, and infrared um, analysis and saw that the, the characteristics of these samples is that they have a really high oxygen content. So it's, if you look at uh, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, so um, the higher the, the total fraction of this oxygen of, of this oxygenated hydrocarbon is, um, oxygen really increases and the other not. So that the characteristics is not the sulfur or the nitrogen enrichment, it's really the oxygen enrichment. So this is kind of like their uh, characteristics there. So you could also say now, well, maybe this is just the original polar compounds that were there that were preferentially enriched. If you have a sample and take everything away that, that, is, that is alkanes and PAHs, the thing that remains then looks like it's increasing, but it's just like a relative increase. So we investigated this by normalizing this whole fraction to a recalcitrant tracer that basically the saturated and aromatic uh, compounds, uh, they decrease as expected. And then if you look at the oxygenated fraction, this actually increases relative to this internal recalcitrant trace. So we, we used hopane for this. So this points to this is really newly formed because if it's virtuous preferential enrichment, this would follow this flat line and there wouldn't be any change. So we have also other data to support this uh, hypothesis. Another thing we found is that they actually correlate quite well with molecular ratios that are indicative of various transformation processes. So one issue we have with, um, with the oil, if, if you want to come up with a, a good x-axis, uh, the time isn't always the best way to characterize the degree of weathering because um, if you have this big submerged oil mass out there and they're continually like uh, small pieces of this oil is breaking apart and washing ashore. You uh, sometimes have pretty fresh oil coming there that didn't weather much and sometimes you have like really weathered one. And what we found is that the amount of oxygenated hydrocarbons is kind of like a nice proxy to assess how weathered uh, oil is. So uh, one of this ratio here to the left is a uh, phytane over hopane, so this uh, can be biodegraded um, not that fast, but it biodegrades eventually, and hopane biodegrades much slower. So you see that the more you have phytane biodegradation going on, the more oxygenated hydrocarbon fraction you have in a sample. Similar for, for another uh, compound, which is a homohopane that also the more this is degraded, uh, the more oxygenated hydrocarbon this is. And I just want to mention that there, if you look at literature, I think more and more studies come out to investigate now this oxygenated hydrocarbon fraction. Um, and I want to point out like one example where um, we want to look a little bit more at the molecular composition of this. So all these data are shown now 
I just told you this is like a lot of this oxygenated hydrocarbons, but I think what we're still working on is identifying now what are the, how is the molecular composition of this fraction looking at, and I think by using um, high resolution mass spectrometry, this we do in collaboration with uh, our colleagues at, at Florida State, Ryan Rogers, Amy McKenna, uh, you can basically look at, shoot the sample in a high resolution mass spec and get a peak for every compound that's present, and then you can assign a molecular formula to all the compounds, to all the peaks, and from this molecular formula you can see like how much oxygen is there, how much carbon is there. And what we found there, how many, if you, how many compounds are present in Macondo well oil, you have about 14,000 that you can account for. Um, if you look at a weather sample, you could intuitively expect that you have uh, less compounds being present because things degrade and, and goes away, so the complexity decreases. But what actually was found is that the complexity increases, so you found like more compounds being present. That means this degradation product they leads to more more compounds being present. You can then zoom in and assign this molecular formula to it, and you see these red peaks are all new compounds that are being formed, and a lot of them actually contain oxygen. So this would like support more our hypothesis that during oil weathering you create these compounds that are oxygen containing, um, that are relatively recalcitrant. I just want to spend two slides on some like ongoing research. What we're now interested in is making really the step of saying, so so what? So are these oxygenated hydrocarbons a big deal or not? And I think we should look into uh, how are they, what is their fate in the environment? Um, kind of like how are they dissolving in the water column? Can they be uptaken in biota? And do they have toxic effects? And another thing we're doing is working more on, on a mass balance of saying, so far, all the mass balances have been pretty much done based on, on GC data. So this would be just looking at the blue bars. As you have Macondo oil, um, saturated aromatic compounds, and then de de degrading over time. If you also include the oxygenated hydrocarbons, which are being formed during this uh, process, you may end up with like a different mass balance. And I just want to spend. Uh, a couple slides or four slides on the second part, um, the degradation of these fingerprinting compounds. So um, I think it's important to realize that um, if you want to fingerprint uh, Macondovel oil, it's, we mostly rely on methods that were developed for pretty fresh spills. So if you look at old spills, you may have also some of this biomarker compounds that are um, indicated here with this like circle, these are sterines and hopanes that are pretty indicative of, of, of an oil. However, what we found, um, I point you like, this is two, uh, two dimensional GC chromatograms where we look from, uh, from the top of this kind of like mountain valley environment, you have a fresh oil to the left, you have uh, a weathered oil to the right, and this area that I circled here are the, is the biomarker region that's generally believed to be very um, conservative, very recalcitrant to degradation, to photooxidation. So we can use this to fingerprint oil. Um, however, this is some of these compounds that we're looking at. That what we looked, what we found out, if we looked at all these compounds developing over time, we found that some of the key um, fingerprinting compounds are actually degrading over time. So here on the y-axis is how much of these compounds are being lost. The two uh, graphs here to the left show that two compounds are pretty stable over time, so we can use them for fingerprinting. Um, some other compounds that are mostly homohopanes, they're actually being lost up to like 50% over time. So that means if you rely on um, for fingerprinting, we, we make ratios of the different compounds to compare it to a source. So if you make these ratios, then you end up with like a, a non-match then if you follow the strict uh, traditional uh, standardized methods. Um, this also applies to triaromatic sterines. So 
I guess what I want to say here, we still have a lot of ratios that are pretty reliable to be fingerprinted. But if you want to really fingerprint this old oil, you need to like rethink the, the traditional standardized methods of, of fingerprinting and, and put into account that some of this ratio may have changed over time. And with this, I want to end and just reiterate these two findings. Like, first of all, oxygenated hydrocarbons, this is like a big pool of the samples are, are they and they're being formed. And we need to think about uh, oil forensics. And I think on, on a kind of like scientific basis, using this study and using deep horizon oil samples, um, I think we could really like add to this diagram and, and make this more complete now. And with this, I'd like to uh, acknowledge support from from Gomery, Deep Sea, and, and our new grant NSF and uh, all my collaborators here. Thanks a lot.